Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. If you enjoy this program, come on over and join us at the World of Warbirds Patreon. There's plenty of free stuff there, including all the images to accompany the episodes, so you can see what I'm talking about. If you want to commit to the relationship, there are advantages to being a patron of the podcast, such as getting the episodes a week earlier and getting bonus episodes, and you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're helping to contribute to the podcast. If you are presently listening to this through Patreon, well then, thank you for your support. And now on to today's show. Have you ever seen the 1946 film, The Best Years of Their Lives? You should. It's one of the best movies ever made about the process of the veterans coming home. There's a scene where one of the main characters is walking through an aircraft boneyard after the war. It looks like a dinosaur graveyard and there is a feeling that the aircraft are just skeletons, or devoid of souls. Of course they are. The departing crews were their souls. The character climbs up into one of the big birds and clearly feels a continuing fascination with the aircraft, but also has waves of horror strike him as he remembers what he saw and experienced and survived. In this episode, I will try to explore the soul of the aircraft, the cruise. If you think back to the big bomber episode, the concept of strategic bombing was just so promising. It sounded so perfect for friend and foe alike. The bomber would always get through, flying too high to be hit by AA, and too fast to be stopped by fighters. There would even be time and the grace to warn the enemy factory workers to get out. They could just grab their coats and lunch boxes and I guess munch on sandwiches while their munitions factory was neatly blown up by the bomber's bombs. No one would get hurt. Nothing beyond the factory would be damaged. And the enemy population would get demoralized and tell their government to come on, just quit. It sounded lovely. Reality, of course, was very, very, very different. I think the best way to tell that story is to read a transcript of a war bond speech that was made by B-17 pilot J. Marvin Turner. I will read it verbatim. On January 23, 1944, our crew of 10 on a B-17 landed on a base in Italy we had been training and working together for about five months previous to this time. And we were all ready and eager for combat. That is what they gave us. And this is a story of what happened to that crew. At first we didn't fly together as a crew. They split us up and we flew individually with experienced crews. On February 25th, just one month after we landed there, our radio operator was sent out with another crew on a mission to Regelsburg, Germany. 50 B-17s without escort went on that mission, and before it was completed, 20 were shot down. The figure 20 doesn't sound like much, but you have to stop and remember that there are 10 men on each plane. That means 200 men went down. Not all of them were killed, but a good number of them were. The plane that my radio operator was on was hit by an enemy fighter, went out of control, crashed into another plane, and they both went down together. Of the 20 fellows on those two planes, only three or four got out. My radio operator was one of the lucky ones, so he's now a prisoner at Stuttgart, Germany. A B-17, or any heavy bomber, has 13 50 caliber machine guns on it. But they aren't much use when attacked by an overwhelming force of enemy fighters. Without fighter protection of our own, we don't stand much of a chance against the large number of enemies. About a week later, on March 2nd, I was flying with another crew over the Anzio beachhead. It seems the Jerry's had a large concentration of troops behind the lines and were about to make a push to break up our beachhead. 
Intelligence found out about it and gave the job to the Air Force. Our planes were loaded with anti-personnel bombs and we dropped them right over concentration. We must have done a good job because before that push was over, or that push rather was never made. However, the reason I remember that day is because the Jerrys were so accurate with the anti-aircraft bombs used against a lot of the other planes that had been over there a number of times before, so that they had had good practice and really know how to shoot. As we were going straight down on a bomb run, I could see the shells bursting directly in front of us and knew that we were going to get hit. The first burst hit our number four engine. That's the outboard on the right wing. The oil began to pour out and it began to run wild, with the power going about three times as fast as it should. This caused a terrific vibration in the plane. Ordinarily, we could shut it off, but the mechanism was shot away and there was nothing that we could do but let it run wild. A second later, another burst hit the number three engine. That's the one on the, the other one on the right wing. And the same thing happened to it. The vibration the two set up was so terrific that a piece of armor plate lying on the radio room floor, weighing about 35 or 40 pounds, came up four to six inches off the floor. Another burst of it hit the plexiglass nose. With the navigator riding in the nose, he, he never even got a scratch. However, there was a colonel riding there also, just to see what combat was like. A piece of that shell burst right through his left foot, taking three toes with it. So he found out what combat was like in a hurry. Another burst went through the radio room and made it look like a sieve. The radio operator was in there, but where I can't imagine because he didn't get a scratch. It's probably a good thing too because that was his 50th mission and last mission. A few days previously, on his 49th mission, he had gotten five good-sized holes so that he wasn't really able to fly now, but he was so anxious to fly his 50th mission so that he could go home that he had begged the docks to release him so that he might complete his missions. Another burst hit the ball turret. A piece of that burst went up through the turret between the operator's legs and hit the sight, which was just an inch or two in front of his face. The sight was smashed all to pieces, and the fuel and the parts were flying around inside the ball. However, the operator did not get a scratch. That's rather a good thing, too, because he was also flying his 50th mission. He decided that it was no place for him, so he came out of there in a hurry. I got down out of the upper turret around the same time because it was easy to see that the plane wasn't going to hold together long enough for us to get back to our base. I asked the pilot if there was anything I could do. He said yes, hand him his parachute. So I gave him and the co-pilot their chutes, then picked up mine and walked back to the bomb bay to the radio room where the operator was sending out SOS messages, and then on to the waste where the rest of the boys were standing around with their parachutes on waiting for the order to bail out. I put my chute on and then somebody said, kick out the emergency door. So I went over, pulled on the release, kicked on the door, but nothing happened. I pulled and kicked again, but still nothing happened. I did this three or four times and the door just stayed there. Finally, we located a screwdriver and pried on the emergency release until the door came off. This must have taken about five minutes. And if anything had happened in the meantime, we would have been dead ducks because that was our only exit. All nine of us were lined up there in the waist, waiting for the order to bail out. I looked down and saw that we were flying over water. I wondered why that was, since if we were going to bail out, the best place to do it, naturally, would be over land. The pilot told us later that the reason we didn't bail out over land was because we had shot the anti-personnel bombs on the troops and had probably killed a good number of them. Naturally, those that were left wouldn't have been very friendly so they no doubt would have taken pot shots at us as we came down. So we decided to go out to sea and take our chances on landing on the ocean. Of course, we didn't know this as we were standing back there, still waiting to bail out. As I stood there looking at the water, 
I happened to notice that I had my wristwatch on, and I thought, doggone, I'm not going to ruin this thing when I get in the water. That's a funny thing to think about at a time like that, but that seemed to be my only concern right then. Somebody suggested that we have a cigarette, so one of the waste gunners pulled out a brand new pack, opened them up, and passed them around. And everyone stood there smoking. We were all very calm and collected, and didn't seem to worry about a thing. I actually think we wanted to bail out and find out what it was really like. In a few minutes, it came over the intercom that we were going to ditch, that is, land on the ocean. We threw out all the armor plate, ammunition, guns, everything that was loose in the waist of the plane, out the door. Then we took off our parachutes, heavy flying boots, and went in the radio room and sat down on the floor. We doubled up our knees in front of us, rested our backs against the fellow's knees in front of us, and cupped our hands behind the fellow's head in front of us. That was to keep his neck from snapping when we hit the water. We were doing 90 miles an hour when we hit the water, and we stopped instantly. We went from 90 miles an hour to zero in nothing flat. That shook us up quite a bit. The bulkhead came crashing up through the floor, back to the radio room, and a big hole opened up in the side and the bottom of the ship. We were knocked out by the impact, but at the same time, the room half filled with ice-cold water, and that revived us. So that we were knocked out and brought back to all at the same time. The radio operator jumped up and pulled a release on the two life rafts. I was the one to get up, got out to the raft on the left-hand side of the plane. I was supposed to cut the cord holding the raft to the ship, but the shock of landing had knocked the knife from my hand, so I had no way to do this. The pilot, who was also flying his 50th mission, got to the raft at about the same time I did. He said, how are we going to cut this thing loose? I said, I don't know, but the rope is supposed to break when the plane goes down. He said, well, here's hoping. We didn't have any more time to talk then because we had been standing on the wing and then the plane left us. It was less than 30 seconds from the time we hit the water until the plane was completely gone. The ropes did break then, all right, and the two rafts floated. However, there were three fellas still inside the radio room when the plane went down. Somehow they got out. I don't know how, and they don't either. They said later, the fellas, that someone reached in and pulled them out. We know that didn't happen, because we were all too busy trying to save ourselves. They popped to the surface a couple of yards away and managed to get to the rafts okay. We started to climb in, but with all of our heavy, wet clothing on and a five-foot wave passing us around, it was quite a job to climb over the high sides of the raft. As we were climbing in, we heard someone call. We turned around to see the eleventh man floating in the water about ten feet away from us. He must have been scared so badly he couldn't move because he made no attempt to swim or help himself in any way. He just stood there in the water with his life preserver holding him up and calling to us to come and help him. We called to him and said we would, but there wasn't much we could do right then. We continued climbing into the raft, and by the time we were able to start paddling, the wind had blown us about 75 yards away from him. We continued to call to him and give him encouragement while we paddled, but all that the paddling was doing was turning us in circles. Those rafts don't have any bow or stern, so there was not one way that we could control the direction. Our young co-pilot, all about 19 years old, said, I can't sit here and watch him go down like that. I'm going after him. We argued with him, did everything we could to try to stop him. It was hard to lose one, but it was much worse to lose two. And we knew that no one stood a chance in the water that day. However, nothing we could do or say would stop him. He took off all his heavy equipment, everything but his light uniform, took two life preservers and threw them over. The fellow he was going after was at least a hundred yards away from us by then, and we could just barely see his head bobbing up and down once in a while and very faintly hear his calls. The co-pilot 
got about 50 yards away and stopped to rest on a box that was floating there in the water. He called to us to come after him. We were paddling all the time, but making no headway at all. We called to him and told him to come back to us. But he said no, he was going on. And with that, he let go of the box and started to swim again. He called to us several times after that, and we continued to call to him until the end of about 20 minutes, and we didn't get any answer. We never did see either of those two fellows again. We knew that there was nothing more that we could do to help them. So we set about trying to save ourselves. We were completely out of sight of the mainland, but we could see an island about 15 miles away. Our paddling served only as a means to keep us warm, so we took off our scarves and tried to make a sail. However, they were too small, and even though the wind was quite strong, they weren't any help. In a few minutes, we saw an airplane coming. We thought, well, good, we're going to be picked up right away. None of us had ever seen a British air rescue plane before, so we didn't know exactly what to look for, and so we started to signal the plane. However, as it came closer, we began to feel sure that it wasn't friendly. And when it got close to us, we found out it was a German Ju-88. It was just skimming the water and flying a little to one side of us. It went by so close that we could see the expression on the pilot's face. We tried to make ourselves as small as possible, but there wasn't much of any place we could go out there. I don't know if he didn't see us. I can't figure out how he could miss. But if he did see us, I don't know why he didn't come back and try to shoot us. However, he just flew off and didn't come back. That gave us a kind of scare, so we were leery about trying to signal any more planes. However, in a little while, we did see some planes that we knew were definitely British, and they were looking for us. We also saw a rescue launch. They were all looking in the spot where our plane had gone down, while the wind had blown us about three miles away. They couldn't see us. We were just another speck on the ocean for them, and we couldn't find our flares, so we couldn't signal them. So we had to just sit there and watch them look for us without being able to do anything. It was just like a game of hide-and-seek. After four hours of floating around like that, one of the fellows was pushing around in the bottom of the raft and found a flare kit. At about the same time, one of the rescue planes flew fairly close overhead, so we fired three flares. We thought he didn't see us because he turned and went away while we were beginning to feel pretty low. We didn't know when another plane would be around. However, when he got to the place where the launch was, he turned and started back in our direction. We knew then that he had seen us and had just gone there to signal to the launch. So we started to feel pretty good. He came back and continued to circle us and drop smoke bombs on the water to indicate our position to the rescue launch. In a few minutes, the launch came alongside and took us on board. That was only a 45 or 40 foot boat but it couldn't have looked better if it had been the Queen Mary itself. They took us below and took off our wet clothing, rubbed us down good, and put warm, dry clothes on us. We just sat there at the table, and they did everything for us like we were babies. Sure made us feel pretty good. The colonel was lying flat on the floor, biting his lip and not saying anything. It had been about five hours since he lost his toes, and we hadn't been able to give him any first aid so he was in considerable pain. The launch had no facilities for treating him, so they radioed a British destroyer that was in the area that had a doctor on board. So they sailed up alongside and took the colonel off. I have heard since that he got all right and went back to his outfit and flew combat again. He certainly was a good egg. The launch took us onto the island we had seen, and we stayed in the British officers' quarters for the next two days. The reason for this delay was because a very bad storm came up right after we got on the island and the water was so rough that the launch couldn't take us back to the mainland. It was a good thing they picked us up when they did or I'm sure we never would have lasted the night out in that raft. We finally got back to the mainland and our base and then they gave us some time off to rest up. I got a three day pass. I came back to my squadron after on Friday night, March the 10th. I looked on the bulletin board and saw that my crew, the one that I had come overseas with, 
was scheduled to fly the next day as a complete crew for the first time. That is, everybody was going to fly their own position, except the bombardier who was flying on the lead ship. I went into operations and they asked if I could fly. I said that I was well rested, ready to start again, and also, since this was my crew's first time, I wanted to be with them. Ed Morrow, the fellow in charge of making up the roster, said, Ah, don't be too eager. Take another day off. It'll do you good. And besides, you'll have plenty more missions to fly with your crew. I argued with him for a while longer, but nothing I could say would make him change the roster, so I went back to my tent and went to bed. The next morning, my crew got up, and my best buddy, a fellow that I'd been with for about a year, had been luckily put on to fly with my crew. He came over, woke me up, and said, In case anything happens today and I don't come back, you know where all my things are and what to do with them. Of course, we had all made arrangements like that with one another, in case some of us didn't come back, that those that were left would take care of our personal articles as soon as they got home all right. However, we didn't talk much about that. So I said, Ah, go on, get out of here. I'll see you this afternoon. So he and the rest of my crew went out and flew on the mission, went up to a target in northern Italy. Just a few B-17s without fighter escorts. There were no fighters to send with them. They went over the target, and all but the lead plane dropped the bombs. They met no flak or fighters, so they decided to make a big circle and go over the target a second time and let the lead plane dump its load. While they were doing this, the Jerrys had enough time to fit up a number of fighter planes. My crew was flying the last ship in the formation, a position known as Tail End Charlie, and always the first one to be attacked by fighters. The Jerrys didn't waste any time this time, and so hit the boys' ship with two rockets. It didn't go down right away. In fact, they even managed to stay in formation until they were 10 or 15 miles out over the Adriatic Sea when their engines caught on fire. And when that happens, you don't ask any questions. You just bail out in a hurry. A few of the boys got out, and then the plane blew up, completely disintegrated, and there was nothing left but a big puff of black smoke. When that had happened, what happened to the rest of the boys, we don't know, since we have never heard another word since that day. They were probably drowned or died of exposure in the water, but there's a slight possibility that they might have been picked up by Italian fishing boats that might have been in the area. That's only a slim hope, but we're holding on to it until the area is cleared and the underground is opened and all the boys are returned. That left just two of us on the original crew still flying, the Bombardier and myself. The Bombardier got up to his 24th mission, but on May 10th he was flying over a target in Austria. He stopped a good-sized piece of flak with his left arm and side. When I heard from him in October, he was still in hospital over there and was in such bad shape that he couldn't even be flown back to the States. He'd had 13 operations and 23 blood transfusions. He really got banged up. That left me all by myself. I did a lot of thinking. When you've lost all nine of your buddies, you can't help but wonder sometimes what's going to happen next. I was put in a tent with five other fellows who had lost all their crew but themselves. So the six of us were the remains of six crews. We kept each other pretty good company. I had pretty good luck from then on, and on July 14th I flew my 50th and last mission over Budapest. When I came back I got out and I kissed the ground. I was pretty happy. I also said a good long prayer of thanks because you can't get on through those things on just luck. It takes a lot more than that. Well. That's the story of one crew. It's not an unusual or outstanding story. The same thing has happened to a good many crews before and will happen to a good many crews before this thing is over. It's not a pleasant thought, but it's something that we all have to face. The only thing we can do back here to bring them back quickly and all in one piece is to work like the Dickens to support these war bond drives 100%. I know that's what you want, and I'm also sure that you won't let us down. Thank you. Survivors Following the war, most B-17s were quickly phased out. It makes sense. The design was over 10 years old, which in this time frame is an eternity, and its younger sister, the B-29, had picked up the torch. 
Even the B-29 would soon be superseded by the even newer B-50. Most B-17s were flown back from the forward areas back to the States where their main useful value was in their metal bones, which should be melted down and made into other useful things. Is it too romantic to think that some of the toasters made after the war had the soul and spirit of B-17s within their very aluminum? I don't know. Could be. The stuff they made back in those days seemed to last forever, just like the veritable fortresses. Old B-17s were used for second-line duties such as the aforementioned Dumbo search and rescue craft, VIP transports, and photo reconnaissance ships. Some birds continued to sacrifice themselves as testing drones, flying through the mushroom clouds of atomic bomb tests, and target drones for developing future surface-to-air and air-to-air missiles. The last operational mission flown by a U.S. Air Force B-17 occurred on the 6th of August, 1959, 24 years after the first prototype flights. B-17 served with at least 25 different countries. 17 Medals of Honor were earned by B-17 crewmen. The type is well represented with 45 survivors and 4 that are airworthy. The Flying Fortress continues to be a survivor, even against everything that has ever been thrown at it, including time itself. I hope you've enjoyed these B-17 episodes as much as I have enjoyed making them. Also, by this time, we've seen at least two trailers for the upcoming Masters of the Air series on Apple TV+, which puts the Fortress in a starring role once again. And although I'm sure we will find little things to criticize and complain about, the series at this point seems bloody amazing, putting us right up there with the crews in that high-altitude hell. I wish we could all watch the series together. I wish I could invite you all over to my house for a watch party. But I guess we'll have to make do with conversations in the comments. Thanks again to all who support the podcast through Patreon. I appreciate it more than you know. You can also check out some photos about what we've been talking about on the Patreon page. These are available to all. And also, please check out the kit shop. You don't even have to buy anything. Just by clicking on the link, you help out the podcast. Until next time.